agenda? There are none. Thank you. Moving right into new business, um, we have some meeting minutes to approve. Move approval as printed. Second. Do you want both or just one? Let's just do um, 25th in case some people weren't at either one. Okay. Anyone have any comments or changes to the meeting minutes from February 25th? I wasn't here, so I won't. Okay. Thank you. All in favor? Six. Lizzie's not here, right? <laughs> like, it's hard to tell who's here around the table. <laughs> Thank you. And meeting minutes of February 29th? Move approval is printed. Second. Any changes or comments? I also have comments. Okay. Okay, all in favor? Six, thank you. And 5.3, high school co-curricular and spring athletic appointments. Those are as uh, presented in your packet. Thank you. Approval, approval is presented. Second. First Boy. Yeah, I know. I, just, I, I look side to side. I am. So after um, having reviewed all of the... Uh, positions here and the appointments, I am curious to know, it's a very lengthy list, what would still be outstanding? There are none that I would see that show it, Mr. Legan. <coughs> I had to figure out where you were sitting. You did? <laughs> um, I anticipate that there would be um, Either it would either be volunteer or booster funded would be the only other positions outstanding, and there may be one or two, but most everybody is here. Okay. And that's the same with the middle school. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jody, are these the same as last year? Um, same positions, same amount, all of that. No. Um, they're the same positions. Um, the amounts might have been adjusted if it was a new person because of the way the the, uh, the collective buying agreement is laid out. So um, there would be a there would maybe a slight adjustment in, in the amount. Lower for a new person. I would guess in most cases it's lower. We did hire a new veteran baseball coach that he was previously um, approved. Um, and his stipend was on that approval several months ago, so he doesn't appear here, for example, but he was a veteran, so his stipend probably wouldn't have been lower because of his past experience. Um, but in some cases, uh, perhaps it is. Jackie? I just have a request that, that uh, we somehow indicate on, on our list who are school employees or why not? One way or the other. When, when we get the list, that's all. How would you? Because there are. Do you, you want full-time employees, professional staff, people, ed techs? How do you want them? Well, anybody who we employ on a regular basis. Teachers. Uh, anybody who is an employee of the school district, other than as a coach. And I mean, there are. I can't speak. They're an employee because we hire them as a coach. But I am. I would like to know who is not. I guess that whichever list is smaller, just indicate this is person is not employed by the school district or something of that nature. That's all. So just to clarify, what Mike was asking, he was wondering, did you want to know if they were a substitute teacher as well? Because that I mean, it's employment of some type in the district, but not a full time. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> looking for that as well. No, I would like to know if somebody is a nurse or a teacher ed or tech, under contract, ed tech, yeah. under contract of some sort. You could safely, probably safely say a full-time employee. There you go. Well, that's uh, primarily. I would just like to know. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's how I'd clarify it because we certainly would, we certainly appreciate these people's hard work and Absolutely. consider and consider them employees as well. I, I understand that as well, but people will say, I don't know if others get the question, how many, <coughs> is, is this person employed by the district? Sometimes I know and sometimes I don't. Thank you, Michael. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, I did. Sorry. No, just as easy as whichever is easiest for you. This is a beginner school board question for you. Where I'm just kind of trying to get up to speed. Um, it it seems to me like there's a there's a sort of uh, almost ranked uh, pay difference between a freshman, a JV, and a varsity coach. Is that true? And could you explain it? And um, is there a set difference between the sports? And if so, could you explain it? Um, the stipends are based on a rubric that's part of the teacher's collective bargaining agreement. And so <coughs> every, every stipend position, um, whether it's an athletic appointment or, or a club activity appointment, is figured based on that rubric. And so, um, yes, there, there is a difference because the responsibilities are different. It all depends on how the rubric is completed for each employee. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Six plus one. Thank you. Okay, five point four middle. Um, no, we just did that middle school with high school, right? Mm -hmm. we just all, all combined. Okay. Okay. So five point five. Um, Notification of an April 2017 high school class trip to France. And I would like to invite Celine Vinette to um, come on up here. and tell us about it. Yes, okay. please. All right. So, uh, as you well know, we had a trip planned for France this year that we canceled. Uh, we are doing a plan uh, a trip in June with a group and taking them to Spain instead. Next year, so we're going to alternate. We, we thought one year we would do uh, a French trip and the other year we would do a Spanish trip. So last year was French, this year we're doing Spanish. Uh, next year again we're going to France. Uh, it's a trip that will go from France, uh, Paris, to Biarritz on the western coast. Uh, going back down to Provence and then the French Riviera ending in Monaco. Uh, it lasts 10 days. We are planning to leave on the Friday of spring break, that very first Friday off, and therefore being back before school is back in session. We don't plan to miss any uh, school day for that. It's with the same company as usual, EF. Um, I'm sure that right now you're thinking about the events in Europe. Uh, just to reassure you, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what, how the company handled the events this week. They did have a few groups that were in Belgium. Um, they were automatically that morning rerouted out of the country and pursued a slightly different itinerary through France. So that's how the company handles it, if anything is to happen the day of, they're automatically booked out of the hotel, rerouted out of the country. So that's how things are handled. Um, there are no warning right now in Europe, but would it come to that, of course, the trip would be completely canceled at that point. Um, the price for the trip for next year is $3,300. Um, and depending when the kids, um, this, uh, we're in a rebate moment right now. So if they miss the date of the rebate, if they, if they uh, uh, enroll in the trip within the month, we're at 3,300 right now. If they enroll a little later, it's, go, it's going to 34. If I'm not mistaken, 3,350 actually. So the quote I have in my proposal is actually 33.50 without uh, the rebate. Anybody have any questions or comments? Questions? Decided I think I want to work for EF when I grow up. <laughs> I think that would be a pretty good gig. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay. So now we are going into the workshop session, mm -hmm. 6.0, and the first was an update on the Scarborough High School class schedule change. Right, and uh, this is uh, David's uh, show uh, tonight, 
David has been before the board um, a few times uh, related to uh, important things like graduation requirements and uh, the high school schedule. Um, as far back as I'm, I'm going to guess David back more than two years ago, and um, and enlightened the board about sort of the long-standing schedule since 1990 that had been in place, has been in place. And so um, this is David's opportunity to um, give you an update on the work that's been done um, with uh, the m multiple levels of folks who have been involved in that schedule discussion. David. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Creech. <coughs> I've been to many of his presentations. So you're on the edge of your seat. <laughs> I am. Mostly for the transitions, right? Well, so <laughs> since you had to bring that up, um, if you all take a look at the handout that's been provided for you, many of you may think the handout is for you to take notes on the actual content. This is actually feedback for me. After each transition, if you wouldn't mind, give me a rating, one to five, five being the highest of that transition, so that next time I present to you, I can totally doing that. kind of spruce it up a little bit. But you brought that up, by the way, Kelly, so that's your fault. I'm going to do it. Mr. Chiazzo, thank you, too, for your positive reinforcement each time I meet. Um, to start the process, um, we thought it might be beneficial just to do a quick recap and a review of what's happened thus far with the schedule development. Uh, and I can say as um, I begin some of this, I'm not going to go through every single note. I just want you to have that as a reference. Uh, the first transition is so that you're, it's almost like you're thinking back to my presentation before. So if you watch that transition, it puts you into that mode. So the rationale for the schedule development, let's begin with that. So as many of you know, this schedule has been in place since 1990. A lot of stakeholder feedback from parents, community members, uh, community dialogue, students, staff, uh, made it very clear to us that we needed to examine our current schedule. So our schedule was going to have a student-centered learning focus. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we had the resources and support necessary to improve student learning and those resources and support in place for staff to do what they need to do. Also, the schedule really needs to support all the academic programs and services that we provide. So that was the rationale. And here's the process. Again, if you want to take a look at that, it's important just to note, as, as Dr. Entwistle mentioned, that we've been involved in this process since the end of 2013-14. So we've really taken the steps that are necessary to ensure that the process is thorough and involves as many stakeholders as possible. We're in the 2015-2016 school year, so we have accomplished what we have listed there on the bullets. It's been decided based on feedback and input that these are the key components for the new schedule. And we already mentioned student-centered learning focus, the resources and supports that are necessary, which I'll go into greater detail in a few minutes. Um, an academic enrichment and support time embedded in the schedule is a key component. Components of an advisory program as well. And then the last two bullets talk about an eight-period schedule where we're increasing the flexibility and the capacity for students to take not just what they need to take for graduation requirements, but what they want to take or something that they are passionate about or something that's going to prepare them well for a college and career. Now, if you think about a scheduled development and you've spent the time that all those who have been involved have spent with this, a scheduled development in and of itself is not a standalone initiative that's happening at the high school. So as we're planning for this, we've really had to take into consideration all that's going on at the high school at this time. And if you talk to educational leaders throughout the country and they talk about change initiatives, they would recommend to you that schools go through maybe one at the most two major initiatives a year. Uh, that's incorrect. I changed it earlier today to six. I apologize. There are six major initiatives that will be going on at Scarborough High School next year. You might want to know, well, what's the reason behind that? Part of it is that we're playing catch up. We're trying to put our school in a position to where we need to be based on what's happening for best practices in other high schools, based on uh, national and state mandates. Uh, but most importantly, it's driven by a need to have a student-centered learning system. And so internally, within the school district, we've embraced these change initiatives. So if you look at all six of those, 
Our students and staff have a lot on their plate. And not only do we want to make sure those initiatives are successful, but we want to make sure that everybody's involved and that we have the resources and time to do those well. So that impacts how we roll out and implement a new schedule. A lot to do. All very important work. So as we turn the page to the next piece, we talk a little bit about, so what have we learned when we've evaluated how to roll out this schedule based on those six initiatives that I mentioned to you before and the fact that it's budget season and we have to be very responsible and physically responsible for what we ask for and the rationale behind it. Here's what we've learned. In order to make this transition, it's really going to have to be a two-year incremental step process. We have to have, over the course of two years, 8.6 FTEs. So the full-time equivalents would provide the following for us. In year one, we're asking for five full-time equivalents. That's going to allow us to support existing courses and existing programs and services. As I've mentioned to some of you before, I could bring out specific data to show you if you needed to see it, but we're turning students away from courses. We're not able to have students sign up for an AP Latin class or an AP Psychology or some of those others because we don't have enough teachers to teach it. So we might have 35 students sign up for AP Latin, but only 25 can take the class. Right now, our, our Spanish one and French one classes are all maxed. They're all 25 students per class because we only have so many teaching sections. If we had more teaching sections, instead of 25, 26, 27 students, we'd have the capacity that's more like it should be, 18 to 20. So students are really, it's a more student-centered learning classroom environment. But as it stands now, we're having, that's the play catch-up part I'm mentioning. We already are past capacity. And we have new initiatives that we're taking on. We're trying to have STEAM-related courses that we're offering, a robotics course next year, uh, AP Computer Science, Intro to Engineering, two new English classes. Um, our teachers have been dying to add electives that we think are, are electives that should be offered for students to prepare them well for after high school, but we've never had the resources to take those steps. 5.0 full-time equivalents this year will put us in a position to not only support those courses, but also move us a step closer to what we need to do for implementation of an eight-period schedule. Once the 8.6 over two years, if that is fulfilled, you have the bullet list there of all that that will satisfy at the high school. Not only the new schedule, but local standards, new graduation requirements, uh, the state mandated changes to proficiency-based diploma, which ends next spring for us in terms of the two-year extension. All of those pieces are in place. The last two bu bullets are really important. Teacher resources are the key for the implementation of this schedule over two years. I mentioned the fact that we don't have enough teachers to teach some of those courses. But in addition to that, um, you have to look at the fact that when you add a course <coughs> choice to students, and if there were 1,000 students, we have to have enough teaching sections to account for 1,000 students. So mathematically speaking, if we don't have those additional 8.6, we don't have the capacity for those students to take additional courses. The other piece of this process that was instrumental is the budget process, as you know, last year that we went to three votes. This year the first vote is June 7th. We're registering for courses now. If we put in for these new courses and through this new schedule in anticipation of it being supported and it was not, there's no way after June 7th that we can go through the course registration process again. It's impossible. So that was another factor in our decision in terms of how to implement this over two years. Here's what we're proposing for that two-year implementation. I've already alluded to most of that, so I'm not going to go over it with you again. The first three bullets I've just spoken to, but I will tell you the last three bullets. If you looked at the details behind the new schedule, we talked about academics, enrichment, and support time. We talked about an advisory program and that increased capacity and flexibility through an eight-period schedule. The first two would be implemented next year. Academic enrichment and support time would be embedded in the schedule, and components of the advisory program would be a part of that time. It would be the same staff member with the same 10 or 11, 12 students every single day. That would happen next year and give our staff a wonderful opportunity to ensure those programs are successful. And the following year, we would implement the new schedule 
as long as we're hopefully able to have those 8.6 full-time equivalents so that we have enough teacher resources to support an eight-period schedule. Fantastic thing that would also happen next year is that teachers would have next year for the professional development <coughs> for implementation of potentially a new schedule model for the following year. So they would have a full year to immerse themselves in whatever changes in instructional strategies or how they deliver content. Let's zoom into this next piece. Those are little extras just so you under, that's for you, Mr. Chiazzo. So I know a lot of you are wondering, based on what I just suggested, what would the schedule be for next year? So I thought I'd share that with you real quick. First, it's going to be a five-period, seven-day rotation, just as we have right now, with the academic enrichment and support time and advisory program embedded between the first and second period. That will be 35 minutes long. That means each class will be 60 minutes long. Now they're 65 minutes long. So we knew when we added this component to a schedule that it would reduce instructional time, but it's minimal. It's five minutes per period. And teachers and staff are comfortable with 60 minutes as opposed to 65. During late start, the late start schedule, I think it's important for you to see what happens to our daily schedule when there's a professional development late start. Currently at the high school, we have two a month. One is for the district-wide K-12 PLT work. And the other one is specific to the high school for content area work and the work that we've been doing integrating technology. If you take a look at how it impacts a day, there are no classes that do not meet. Every class will still continue to meet. There will be no academic enrichment and support time or advisory on a late start Wednesday. Class times simply go from 60 minutes to 50 minutes. So every class meets, they only meet 10 minutes less. And as a former teacher, and, and speaking for our school, 60 minutes to 50 minutes once a week is an adjustment in instructional st strategies that's not going to significantly impact students. They're going from a 60-minute class to a 50-minute class. Um, again, that's, that late start Wednesday schedule that we have had has been, uh, knock on wood today, very successful. Students are either choosing to sleep in late and get that extra hour and a half on a Wednesday, which I know my daughters can't wait for Tuesday night because they know emotionally and physically an extra hour, an hour and a half is huge for them. Other students see it as an opportunity to finish up some work. Uh, those students who don't get their own transportation, who take the bus, every late start Wednesday I walk around the school and observe. They're in our cafeteria. There's probably 100 to 150 students. Our cafeteria seats 400. They're spread out. Laptops open, muffins out, orange juice, having breakfast, very relaxed, um, and they're all supervised. So the professional development time on Wednesdays that we've encountered so far has had minimal impact on the classroom instructional time, and we've had the resources to supervise those students who took the bus in and didn't have their own transportation. That's the impact next year any late start professional development time would have on our schedule. So the schedule implementation will be two phases. I'm going to give you the phases first and then share with you the benefits and outcomes for each phase. Next year, we'll implement the academic enrichment and support time. That will be one staff, professional staff member with around 10 students that will meet with them every day except a late start. Embedded in that same time, probably once a week, will be components of an advisory program whether it's a building-based activity, small group discussions, whatever it is that are a part of the, the advisory program that we want to embed, they'll actually have that happen with that staff member during that time. So logistically, it's a perfect match. The other piece that I mentioned earlier is that our teachers next year will have the professional development over an entire school year to prepare themselves to implement a new schedule model in the following year. Again, that's all dependent upon resources. Second phase, um, in that second phase, we'll be able to restructure our graduation requirements, which we all know is happening at this very moment. Um, and as the changes happen from the Department of Education, we're in a really good position with the work that we've been doing with our current Late Start Wednesdays to be able to support the pro pro proficiency-based diploma criteria to restructure our graduation requirements. Um, we can align those additional resources to support the existing programs. 
and as I said before, resource dependent, that eight period schedule will be in place year two, 2018-2019. Here are the benefits to the first phase. During the academic enrichment and support time, we're providing academic enrichment and support for all students. So let's clarify what that means because many people aren't sure what that time means. That 35 minutes allows students to be involved in, and it's all students, not just struggling students, every student. We have a very busy school when it comes to students' lives. Before school, after school, activities, jobs, the demands of their academics. Students are stretched very thin. Now embedded within the school day, they can go and get support from teachers if they were out and they need to find out what their makeup is, make up a quiz. They can do enrichment activities. They could be involved in an online learning program where they'll have 35 minutes if they want to take an online learning course. They already have the laptops. They can sit down during that time and do work on an online course. And we can provide the resource and supports for them during that time as well. So access to teachers and resources, every teacher is going to be involved in this. Nobody's going to have a class or a study hall. We'll have a system where students can come and see those teachers during those designated times. Um, models that are out there for schools that have started this, it's through the roof in terms of changing in culture and climate. Talk about making a large school feel small. When students know that they can have access to their teachers and get that additional support, it's been instrumental in turning around the culture and climate of schools. And most importantly for us, it's a, it's a service that we believe we should be providing based on the needs of our students. Uh, down below in the advisory program activities, as you all know, this is a tough time to be a kid. Schools are working really hard to provide supports. At our school, even though we have supports in place like counselors and, and caring teachers and other types of programs, our advisory program activities would enhance that and make it more targeted. So we would be able to support the social, emotional, health and wellness needs for all students because every student would be involved in those advisory activities, not just the ones that choose to try to get some of those services. In addition to that, you'll have a teacher that has access to all the students' grades. So if I have 10 students and I'm one of those advisors, I can open up my enrollment through PowerSchool and I can see how they're doing. And if I want to take the time to pull one of them aside and say, Emma, I know you were out yesterday, you're missing your AP Chem class, Looks like you got a couple assignments. Why don't you use the academic enrichment and support time tomorrow to go get that, that makeup or whatever. You have another caring adult who can monitor how they're doing academically. And, and then also, it, you know, you've got guidance counselors have about 300 students per counselor. It's impossible to monitor all of them on a regular basis. So we see that as another added feature. David, excuse me, do you want, can you take questions now or do you want to wait till the end? At the end would be great. If, if you want to jot down a note so you can remember right. I have. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That's what those lines are for. So the benefits of the second phase. Um, when we are able to hopefully get those resources that I spoke to in place, uh, it builds that additional capacity in each core content area. So no longer will you have 25 to 28 students in a Spanish 1 class. You'll have the numbers that they should be. We won't be turning away students for taking AP Latin or AP Psychology. We'll be able to have sections so that those who sign up can take those courses. It also expands the opportunities for placement into those existing programs that want to get started or electives that we want to start, but we've put that in a holding pattern because we only have so many teachers. So we can expand electives and existing programs through those additional resources. Phase two in terms of the new schedule, we will have had a year under our belt where we have worked through academic enrichment and support time in the advisory program. Teachers, staff will be comfortable with it. They'll have a better understanding of how to utilize that. And they will have had a full year of experience. Whereas at the same time, they've had a chance to also get themselves prepared for an eight period schedule. Now I've gone and done this transition. A transition from a 45 or 50 minute class into a class that perhaps is, not that this is the model we're gonna take, but if it is the model we take, and every other day, 80 minute model. And it is different because the content that you cover in one class is different than if, if you have 45 minutes as, a pair to, as, a, as composed to 80 minutes. You have to restructure. 
what you're teaching, when you teach it, and how it aligns, and all the assessments that go with that. That takes time, which they'll have next year to do. So they'll have the opportunity to be well prepared for that eight period schedule in the second phase. As I've mentioned to you before, there are many, many reasons, and I'm not going to ask questions tonight because we have a lot to do, but there are many things that I've shared with you that the new schedule will do for us that will help transition Scarborough High School from a good school to a great school. And there are certainly, with the academic enrichment and support time and the advisory program components, a strong and very compelling argument on how we can help a large school feel small by having those caring adults evolved. And, and we feel very good about not only what we've come up with for a model, but our plan in terms of implementing it over two years. Now we can take some questions. Jackie. I have two how questions. One refers to the rationale for scheduled development. How do you, the staff resources and support improve student learning? Um, several different ways. So if you have more teachers and you're able to have students in classes that have fewer students in it, so instead of 26, 27, 28 students, you have 18 to 20 students. Emma can attest this in classes that are really large compared to classes that are very small. Teachers are able to better provide individual um, attention to students' needs, a better able to differentiate. Differentiate, a lot of people sometimes get hung up on that. Differentiation to me is really simple. You have all kinds of different learning styles in a classroom. You need to come up with instructional strategies that give all those students the best opportunity to be successful. When you have 28 or 30 students compared to 16 or 18 students, it's hard to differentiate and meet the needs of all those students. So the additional resources of additional staff helps students in terms of that learning environment. Also, it's also going to improve student learning, too, when we're providing them some programs that we haven't been able to provide. perfect example would be robotics. Since the first year I've been here, we've had many people from the community who are dying for us to get involved in robotics, which would be absolutely a fantastic program to offer, very enriching, and it, it sends students oftentimes, it, it sends them off into a direction for college or career that may, maybe they wouldn't have considered if they didn't have that experience. Those are just a couple of examples of how adding programs and minimizing uh, existing, I would call challenges in terms of class sizes. Um, and all, the last piece would be turning a student away from a class. I mean, I sit down and spend weeks trying to figure out what can we do so that we don't have to tell 10 students they can't take AP Psychology. We're preventing them from having an experience that if we had more teachers, they could take it. Does that help, Jackie? Thank you. My second how question is the benefits and outcomes in phase one. We have a thousand students in the high school and they come in in the morning and obviously they're assigned to a room. Home room? So they still call Period them one. Home. They go to their period one class. Okay. So those those classrooms are filled with students who have been assigned. Now they have 35 minutes to do all of the academic and enrichment and have the time to do it, but how does that work? How do you keep track of a thousand students who want to see their advisor or want to see their math teacher or want to take an online course? How do you keep track of those youngsters? Great question. So first of all, they're assigned a class. So they're assigned a staff member, and they go and report to that classroom just like they were going to their first, second, third period class so the teachers can take attendance. Secondly, we have two hows to how we manage where they go and, wh and who they're with. One is uh, a fallback, so to speak. It would be just as simple as uh, teachers track individually uh, who they're giving passes to to come and see them. They have to track that on their own. Staff members who are releasing students to go to someone else also will not release a student unless there's a signed pass from a teacher giving them permission to go see them. They would track what students left and where they went. So 
that's a hard copy um, fallback. What we're looking into right now that happens in other schools, a model, is there's a system, um, a program that communicates and is connected with PowerSchool, where, and this, uh, they did it at Cape Elizabeth. Uh, one of our teachers was a part of this, where they, teachers tag a student and indicate who the student is and when they're going to come and see them. And so when I'm looking at my attendance, I can see where this student is slated to go on that particular day. If they don't come to my class and I had tagged them to come here, then I can report that to the office that that student didn't come. And it would also be reported to the teacher that that student didn't come and see me. So there's an electronic means to track where they're going and what they're doing. And also that system has another component. It's a data storing system. So I'm probably not using the right language, so forgive me, Jen, but we would be able to track, uh, for instance, the math teacher that came from Cape Elizabeth High School tells me all the time, he had the most number of tags at the end of the year for students that went and did. You can track where students have gone and what teachers have had them there over the course of the year, so we could track how well this is being utilized at the end of the school year. So right now we're, at, we're having our people talk to their people about whether that's a program that we could use here. If it doesn't jive for the first year, we would go to that fallback. Okay. First, I want to congratulate you on what must have been just a Herculean nightmare of logistical considerations that you had to undertake. Um, I was so just dreamy and wistful the last time you were here and you talked about block scheduling and, you know, there are so many best practice data out there in terms of immersive learning and then there's the sort of practical concerns that there's no such thing as a 60 hour, 60 minute college course and I just wonder what happened to the idea of the block scheduling and is that still on the table and can we get it back on the table if it's not? So the, the eight period schedule, we still plan on having, it would be the second phase of this in the two year phase. So. Uh, you know, one of the things I mentioned is uh, we have to have the teacher resources to have an eight-period schedule. So uh, in the budget, we've worked on a two-phase. We, we need 8.6 over two years. If we have 8.6 full-time equivalents over two years, that's where we can satisfy existing needs and the needs that an additional period in a schedule would call for. So 8.6 right now, I, I'm not sure if that's fiscally responsible to ask for that much money. Um, and let's say that we ask for that much money and 1,050 students go and sign up thinking they have eight choices and the budget process is such that that's cut back and we don't get the 8.6. Uh, that votes June 7th. There's no way to have kids re-register for classes. I thought the eight period schedule was different than the block schedule that you had proposed. Eight period schedule, there's two formats. One is similar to what we currently have, which is five periods a day, but over an eight-day rotation right. instead of a seven-day rotation. Um, the alternating block schedule is eight periods as well. It's four one day and four different classes the next day, and they alternate. And you see those as resource, resource equivalent, those two options, or no? Yes. You do see them as resource equivalent? Yes. It's, okay. It means that one, you know, mathematically speaking, uh, sorry, Dr. Entwistle, but I'm going to go down that road. Former math teachers have to talk about the mathematical piece. 1,000 students, another class. That means we have to mathematically account for 1,000 students. If we had six new teachers, each of them having a normal caseload of, of five classes of 20 students, that's 100 students per teacher. That's 600 students that would be accounted for out of that 1,000. With the remaining 400 students, uh, Emma and Lizzie collected data for us. We found that between 60 and 70 percent of the students claimed that if they had an additional selection, they would choose an elective. So that translates into about roughly about 250 to 300 students that would fill those elective courses that have the capacity to take more students right now. We don't need new teachers in those areas. We have the capacity to absorb more. That means the 150 to 200 students that are left, study halls, which we can manage over an eight period of time. So mathematically speaking, if we don't have those additional teacher resources, then there's no place to put those students. What does it equate to if we use the existing a lot of stu students being turned out of courses, classes going from 20 to 30, 32, 33. Um, that's a logistical nightmare. So that's where the resource piece came in. If you couple that with those six initiatives we have, have next year, um, there's a lot of new change that's happening, and we want this to be a successful. I'd hate to implement it 
rush into it and it fail because the staff is overwhelmed with all the other work that we're having to accomplish. So this gives us a chance to prepare them well for the following year. Well, I just want to go on record and say that, you know, I will always be an ardent supporter of the block schedule and would, you know, love to help fight for whatever resources are required to do that because I just think the benefits are so profound. And the, the second question that I have concerns these initiatives. What would be an acceptable option to you? What would be an acceptable alternative to having more late start websites? To, to having more something yeah. other than late yeah. start? What would be an acceptable? Alternative? Well, in a perfect world, with all the resources we need, um, both community and school, to embed it in the school day and pay teachers for it is probably the most effective, most effective model. So. Those school districts that have the money to have teachers spend an hour and a half or two hours each week in the school day with the resources to ensure that while students are there, they're, they're involved in whatever, or if it's a, at a time where after the students have left, you're paying the teachers to do that. That's probably the best model um, because it doesn't impact the community in terms of the schedule for the students and the families. Um, and it provides uh, a natural part of their contract. I'm being paid to do this. That's probably the best. The most fiscally responsible model, which is the one that most school districts have gone to, and, and I'm not just speaking as a principal, uh, as a teacher, as a department head, and as a, a parent in a community that has late start every Wednesday. It is the best professional development I've ever been a part of or led. And it's the most fiscally responsible because it doesn't cost the school district the money it would cost to pay teachers for an hour and a half every week. So um, the impact obviously for that is the impact on the community having a day a week where they have to adjust their schedules. Uh, but as I mentioned before when I showed you the schedule, uh, and I remember as a classroom teacher, it's a minimal impact. You know, you, you know on Wednesday you have 10 minutes less than you had on, or 15 or whatever it is, than you know on a normal day. It becomes a pattern. It's a part of what you do as a teacher and, and your instructional strategies and what you do on those days is adjusted. Uh, but the best part of it, my daughters all the time, Tuesday night, big smile on their face, I get to sleep in, I won't see you tomorrow morning, Dad, give me a hug and go to bed. The emotional piece and the physical piece to sleeping in, even if it's one day a week, is huge. I see Emma smiling. Um, there are students that are so busy, they come in, they go to the library, they print things off, they get their laptops out. They, those students take advantage of that hour and a half before school. And staff, and we're all human, but this is a reality, staff are far more effective from 7.35 to 9 on a Wednesday morning than from 2.15 to 4 on a Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon. Wouldn't that, a lot of that be solved with a later start time, though? The later start time is still not going to embed professional development time. It would just change the, right, the it day. Would, it would solve the daughters liking to sleep in on Wednesdays. And it would, if the, if the staff do their best work in that early hour and, and monies could be made available to them. Both of those I, I would agree to. I, I think both of those. But in, Because um, on one hand you're saying that the, this, this moment, this, um, the academic enrichment and support time is so great, right? It's mm -hmm. so important, and I totally hear that. But if it's so great and so important, why do we want to take it away every week? Well, because we... we say both things. Right. We have, it's, it, I, I agree with that, too. I mean, we had to have priorities. So staff are very um, committed to their instructional time. And, you know, it's, it's partially to support what the board and community members have said about let's not reduce too much instructional time with the needs of staff being able to get work done in a meaningful amount of time in class um, and finding what's the, what's the balance there. So if we, I, we figured it out, if we did have late start, if we did have academic support time, those 60 minute classes would go to 38. And there's, that's, a, that's a struggle, a 38 minute class. There's not, but 60 to 50 is not as much a stretch in terms of what can be accomplished. So we've considered those factors too. But in a perfect world, embed it as a part of the regular day and pay them. The second best, and models are working all over the country, is it's a physically responsible answer is the late starts. So first option, embed it, make it part of their contract without taking away instructional time for students. Second option, late starts. Yes. Okay. And by the way, if I could add one piece, 
make it weekly. An hour and a half a week is phenomenal. A day every two months. You mean the embedded, make it embedded weekly. Right. And, okay. you know, sometimes people say, well, we'll pay them for a day or we'll pay them for two days or three days. And those, those workshops that are like one every three months for a full day, it's not the same kind of professional development as an hour and a half every single week. It, we've accomplished so much in the schools that I've been involved in that not only are you working and planning things, but you implement it and you revise it, and you, it's, it's remarkable what you can do weekly. <coughs> so forgive me because I don't have high school <coughs> but some of my questions are probably very trivial. But what is the late start schedule currently? When, when kids come late, how long are they in class? Add five minutes. So currently we're 65 minutes right. for classes instead of 60. <coughs> So, but on late, you no know, late start Wednesdays, isn't it a brief? I would assume it's short. Oh, shorten it by five minutes. So if it's going to be the same thing, it's just proportional. So adding the academic support time, that 35 minutes, um, reduced classes from 65 minutes to 60, because we were doing that academic support time. And on a late start, it went from a 60 to 50 minutes because we didn't have the academic support time but we, fit, we would fit all five classes in afterward. So it's just um, with no academic support time like we have right now, you have those five minutes back. <coughs> okay. That's okay. probably a poor explanation, but no, I, I, does okay. it make sense? Yep. Okay. And then how many students do you estimate are using, or maybe Emma can answer this, are, you, are coming on the bus on late start? Like how many kids are in the cafeteria or in the gym? For the high school only late For the high school only late start. I see probably 100 to 150, mostly underclassmen, a few upperclassmen. I think I wasn't here for this meeting, but I know Lizzie spoke to the fact that at times when she can't get a ride, she comes in the morning and she goes into the cafeteria and does work, and she sees, I think her observation would be the same that I shared with you earlier. About, about 100 to 150, and most of the time those are students who either don't have transportation, they're upperclassmen, or some of the freshmen or sophomores. But it's really cool to see, if you're ever around here during that time, if you walk by, because, you know, we all worried about how that would happen. First, we have the, the supervisory roles in place. And second, when you see them in there, they're relaxed. They're having a muffin. Their laptops are up. They're doing some work. It's very, a very relaxed atmosphere, but they have a place to come and do some work if they need to take the bus instead of get their own ride. Those are good questions, by the way. I have a couple more. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to, I, I feel at a disadvantage because I'm not a, a, a high school student parent. So I feel like I need to keep, I'm going to, the pressure's going to be on Emma to sort of help me. You can be my pretend child for the day. But how do you feel for those days? For late start Wednesday, are you like, oh, God, it's late start Wednesday. I'm used to, you know, I, it's, I'm off schedule now. Or do you enjoy it? Are you smiling on Tuesday nights? Personally, when late start rolls around, I, I can't wait. I mean, I like, I usually use the time to sleep in. Um, sometimes, though, there will be Tuesday night where I have a lot of homework and I'm saying, nope, not doing any more tonight. I was saving it for the morning, so I'll get up the next morning at the normal time and just sit down and have breakfast and do that. Um, and I, I, I like the late start, but it does make classes. I wouldn't say it's rushed, but it's just different. You know you have a shorter amount of time. So um, take, for example, my statistics class. Usually we take the first couple minutes of class going over homework, and then we'll do the rest of the class, a lecture period, and we take notes the whole time. Um, when late starts happen, we just kind of forego the going over the homework from the night before, and we just do the notes the whole time. So. And how do your friends feel about it? I would say they agree with me, and most of the time we're sleeping in and can't wait for late starts, and we get the text the night before reminding all our friends, hey, don't forget, late starts tomorrow, sleep in. <laughs> so. And if I could put a plug in for the work, Emma and Lizzie have been the school leaders that when we've done all our work on the schedule, I pulled them in this year, and they helped organize bringing other student leaders in to be a part of the process who have actually joined the committees. We had three committees. And the two of them work with me, and they created uh, and they led assemblies for each grade level. They created a survey that was given to all the students to get feedback for us 
Uh, they've been hugely instrumental in that feedback from the stakeholder group that are students, and they've done a fantastic job with all that. And if it wasn't for their efforts, we wouldn't have the feedback or the input from the students, and they've done a fantastic job. So that's my plug for Emma and Lizzie. And we're not surprised. <laughs> um, and then just one clarifying comment. The phase two is the 2017-18 school year, correct? Yes. Okay. No, um, yes. 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 Because you said 2018, and then I thought, oh, God, that's way up. Okay, that's good. I sometimes throw myself off when I'm doing FY17, FY18. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question. I just want to clarify again. So you're saying of the 8.6 uh, STEs that you're going to be requesting down the road here, it's in two sections. So five in this coming fiscal year, and then the other 3.6 following. Yes. And then the other thing was you mentioned something about um, the other courses that were going to be offered if it comes to fruition, um, the robotics, and then you said there were new English classes. What type of English Electives. Classes? You know, oftentimes um, we find that uh, speech and debate and some of the other electives are taken by students because it can fulfill their fine arts requirement. So we were trying to offer them something that was a little bit more interesting. There's a detective <coughs> stories. Um, elective that's going to be offered, and I'm drawing a blank for the second one. But the English department head has been coming to me for three years saying I, we, this would be exciting. I've shared this with students. They would love to sign up for this. But each year we've sat down and looked at the reality of how many teaching sections with existing courses and we couldn't offer them. So this year we're offering them. Right. Is the same going for things like in the social studies department and the science department as well? Yes. Sure. So AP Computer Science this year, that teacher had to differentiate because not every student was prepared for an AP rigor and the results. So he differentiated and had an honors level and an AP level in, in, in the same class. So based on that, we're going to have an honors level and an AP level. So we have a new section of that next year. We're going to do the robotics program that uh, Monique and other members of the community, and it's been like a phase 6 through 12 type of initiative. We'd like to kind of take that positive momentum that's happening at the middle school and with some of those programs outside, have it as a course taught here, and then have the, the competition phase be almost like um, a club or an activity outside of that where a stipend would be attached for the person involved in it. So not only do they get the robotics in-house, but they can be involved in what's really exciting for students who are part of those programs. If you've ever been to them, it's like a rock concert. It's amazing, those robotics uh, those competitions, but they would be able to be involved in both aspects. Just, just a few examples. Thanks. This is, mm -hmm. These are all if you get to five FDEs for this following year, all of these new, the robotics, the new AP sections, the English electives, all of that could be available for this coming year. We have five. put those in the program of studies, and we're uh, hoping and trusting that we get the 5.0. So kids have been signing up as you're doing the registration. Those are all available right now? Yes. That's awesome. Okay. Um, I have a, just a couple of questions. Most of it's been covered. but So the cafeteria is a place for supervision on those high school only late start dates. Is there another, like the study center or library where kids can go and it might be quiet for like if they just need to buckle down and do work and not hear all the morning chit chat around them? Um, if, if we needed to expand that down the road, we could do that. We have the supervisory mm -hmm. capability to do that. Okay. But um, right now, the study center, they're okay. involved in professional development. Yeah. Um, but we do, ha and, and the learning center and study center, believe it or not, are used for some professional development. You know, the, integ the integration of technology has been fantastic, and there are times where Jen Adams or Alicia will have whole two or three departments come into the all-purpose room or the study center, and she'll go over and show them how to implement you know, technology and integrate it. So those areas sometimes are used, and we like to reserve them for that purpose. But if we needed to, we do have the capacity. It's a quiet room. And we, not only do we have the capacity, but we would have the personnel that could cover it. Okay. And those, um, so when students go to academic support or the advisory group, it, are you envisioning those being the same 10 kids that would be doing advisory activities together? Yes. And how are those groups formed? So uh, there are different models out there. The model that we're leading toward is grade alike. Grade alike, uh, I've been in a school where it was um, 
mixture because we wanted to expose students to different uh, types of students, different grade levels. Uh, we looked at the grade alike because when we do building-based initiatives, it's really, we're going to be in a great place to have maybe all freshmen come and, and maybe we have a TED talk on bullying and we bring in outside experts. And then the very next week in that same group, we've got 10 students that, that the advisor could have a small group discussion on what did you think about the TED talk? Talk to us a little bit about what's having, happening here. And now that we have one-to-one -one technology, we can use a Google form to give them a brief survey and give us feedback on the things that we need to hear from them in terms of what's happening in the school. We can use that data to guide us on next steps. So grade alike is probably what we'll go with, uh, and they'll have the same person for four years. So typical advisories vary in how often they meet, but because we're going to do advisory components once a week, it's important we keep them with the same academic support time person. So they're building that relationship and that trust, and they'll have that same person for four years from their freshman year on. And so then building alike, but then within, I mean, like grade alike, but within that, how is it determined? Like, um, you know, say we're all high school students, right. all freshmen, which, how, how do you we haven't decide? We haven't decided that piece yet. Okay. Yeah, the other, the, there, are some, there are some schools that do inventories. Uh, they have you talk about your interests and, okay. and other things, maybe five or six things. And then they take, like for instance, for our um, NEAS self study, we ask teachers to give us their top three choices for the standards that they want to be involved in. And we ensure that every teacher was in one of those top three choices. So we can get a, a, like, almost like a personality inventory for students. And if, you're, if you want to have great alike, but you want to make sure they're not all five um, involved in music or all five that, you know, of the same type. Those inventories can sometimes be used to make sure you have a mixture within a grade, but that hasn't been decided yet. We still have a, a few months to make that determination. Anybody have any other questions? I have a okay. okay, David, thank you. I think you did a great job. Could you just go back a couple of slides here because I just want to ask um, a clarifying question. Um, and back again to phase one. Okay, so when you look at phase um, one, all of the things that you put in terms of um, the benefits will happen next year. Uh, and um, one of the pieces that most excites me, honestly, about that, um, that uh, enrichment and support time is that it also creates opportunities for students to do what we want them to be doing, which is working and learning together. So there can be, that can be time for collaborative learning, it can be time for project work for students to be uh, working on, and um, is that your yeah, understanding? And, and thank you for reminding me. We, we just had this conversation just recently. Uh, an exciting thing uh, along the lines of what Dr. Entwistle is, is mentioning is those of you who have been in the all-purpose room, it's a multimedia room. So um, let's say that teachers are focusing on those individual needs for, t for students that have been a tag to go and see them. We could use the all-purpose room, how's that with Jen Adams um, and two or three other staff members so that let's say um, one of the physics teachers uh, honors physics class or AP physics class on Thursdays wants to meet there as a group and go over work. We could have the all-purpose room as a location for little study groups during that time. We'd still use the same process of tagging them and determining where they go, but we had talked a little bit about it not just being seeing an individual teacher but it could be giving them opportunities to collaborate with other students at times when they typically don't because, as you know, not all students in the same class have the same studies. But if five of them want to get together, you know, during the week and go into the all-purpose room and work on their physics, that's another opportunity they typically wouldn't have. Thank you for reminding me. Um, and I'll, I'll remind you of something else, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the, the whole idea of uh, providing opportunity for students to pursue online learning um, is great. They have that opportunity. But one of the things that I learned being um, one of the early involved, uh, being a leader of an early involved district in terms of online learning is that students still need the support of an adult in terms of being successful. Most students, the, it's only the exceptional student that can get through an online, and I I look at Emma, um, uh, that can get, you know, get through an online course uh, without some kind of support. So that also, in, in my mind, given the fact that you're saying that there's supervision available, could be made available for students who are taking 
online classes. Is that and that was my reference to Jen Adams, who is our um, technology integrator coach. And so perhaps we could house her in the all-purpose room. And so for any of the technical pieces of what Dr. Entwistle is referencing, she, she, could, she could support them. But we would have some additional staff, too, that could support them in terms of just navigating through an online course. And as you know, some of those are easy, navigable, are easy to navigate and some are not. So we would have the resources so for that. So all of those things would be happening in phase one? Yes. Could you go to phase two? Because I do like your slides, but it seems to me that when you look at building additional capacity in each of the core content areas, expanding opportunities for placement into existing programs, and expanding electives across the content areas, all of those are also going to be happening in phase one. Yes, it, with the added resources. With the, with the right, conditional on getting those resources. Right. That will that all of those things will actually start happening next year. They would. When I put that uh, piece together, I was thinking more in terms of the new schedule. Those resources, not only the new schedule, but what does the new schedule mean in terms of the additional resources like that are referenced there? Because the schedule not only gives them another choice, but it does this that Dr. Entwistle talked about. And, and, uh, there, is, there are so many other details to this that we could share with you that are the benefits. Um, but we were hoping just to capture those things that would kind of get to the heart of, of what our new schedule will offer. Okay. And thank you for the questions. Those are great questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Is he going to get his five teachers? If we have anything to do with it. <laughs> okay, so now um, moving on to 6.2, update on the 24-month student-centered plan. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to um, I just want to bring up a, a couple of slides here. So this is, um, you know, we've tried every which way to do updates on the improvement plans that we've had. Um, my uh, calibration has uh, been uh, try to, to share as much information as possible before the point where people's eyes start blossoming <laughs> over or, or close one or the other. So um, we are going to do that same work tonight. We don't use the mic to people at home. Oh, I'm sure they can. <laughs> um, so I, I think what we're going to try to do tonight is, um, and what I know we're going to do, is I've asked each of the school leaders and district uh, leaders to really think about a few particular highlights that they would like to tell you about. Um, and, and obviously, there's a lot of us. There's a lot of schools, a lot of departments and a lot of responsibilities at the central office. Um, and so we're, we are going to try to move that. The good news is there's nothing that you have to look at, and we're not going to be flashing slides. So I really want it to feel more like a little bit of a, a relaxed uh, kind of chat. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll listen to, um, I see some of my team members laughing at me. Uh, <laughs> but, but a relaxed kind of chat is, is nice, uh, particularly at this time of night. And so what I would uh, do is encourage you uh, to just really um, sit back and, and listen to the work as being highlighted by these leaders in terms of what they uh, would like to share with you. Um, this is all connected to the plan, and um, as we get to the district uh, part of the plan, I will um, I'll actually, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, show you tonight, so just to keep you on your toes, I'm going to actually show you the new district dashboard that we use. So that's coming up um, very soon. Um, the areas that seem to make most sense for us in terms of thinking about the plan and reporting out on the plan 
um, when we step away from the details of the plan is really looking at how have the following uh, impacted uh, the improvements in our schools? How have the curriculum resources that we've received, uh, the curriculum resources that we've reassigned, um, the staffing resources that we've received as new staff or we have redesigned some sort of program and de redeployed staffing resources or how have some of the structural and organizational changes that we've done um, uh, um, uh, uh, impacted the, our improvement efforts. And so the leaders will be hitting on um, a, a couple of those probably and, um, and we'll go through the sequence and we're starting here with Allison um, and you can see the sequence on the, uh, the right side of the slide. So um, if you're all agreeable to that, and that's what we would like to do. Um, questions are invited, obviously. Um, we'd like to try to keep this uh, moving uh, just so that uh, we get done uh, what we need to get done in a reasonable time. And Emma can uh, get home and get some work done. Um, so uh, I think, uh, Allison, I, I might be <coughs> We're being casual and just sitting around. I, I al almost table. wish we could dump, like dump, um, bring the lights down. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in Kmart or... Whatever, they like whatever. Whatever. Harsh tonight. They do seem harsh. Where's the fire? I'm not comfortable with them lights. The ambiance. I don't trust the people in So, Allison, there's been much fanfare. But there you go. Oh, you're all set. Oh. Um, so I tend to get excited about the work that um, we're all doing. So I think I'll read my comments to keep me focused and timely. Um, and of course, ask any questions. So how uh, some highlights relate uh, to the curriculum resources. Uh, we have continued our work in special education to address students' instructional needs in the area of study skills. Within our 24-month improvement plan under Goal 1, we've identified a timeline and a procedure for, fee for each phase level that advances student, student learning in this area. Uh, in order to achieve this target, we piloted a new set of skills model at the middle school um, this year for special education students. Uh, some of the steps included um, staff reviewing seven different curricular resources. They selected one text to pilot. That text is the Executive Function Workbook. We selected that as it engages each student uh, through an online questionnaire to identify their strengths and weaknesses in eight different areas of executive functioning. Uh, students set personal goals, which were reviewed and are currently monitored by themselves and their special education teacher. Direct instruction is done through mini lessons using visuals, graphic organizers, and supported practice in such areas as time management, planner use, note taking, planning for large assignments, homework completion, backpack organization, and active reading. Uh, in addition, uh, a rubric is being piloted for students to track their progress and they can earn weekly and monthly um, incentives. Those have also been incorporated. Um, in order to achieve this, we did re reallocate a .5 ed tech to assist in the delivery of this structure within the resource room. Setting. As a result of these efforts, currently 40 students um, are scheduled in receiving special ed instruction in the area of study skills in this pilot project at the middle school. In addition, at the high school, we're in the second year of an elective pass-fail course hired, um, offered to high school special education students who demonstrate weaknesses with study skills due to a disability. This course is delivered in a special education classroom Instruction is focused on planner use, materials, attendance, assignment completion, work habits, and any additional individual needs identified in the student's IEP. Grading is based on a rubric that is scored by the student and teacher. Um, with this class scoring rubric, as well as the students being awarded credit, we've seen a significant increase in student engagement during the specialized study hall time. So as a result of these uh, efforts, Currently, we have 65 students enrolled in passing this course. Um, a highlight.
website uh, for staffing resources. Um, we have been able to offer more supports in addressing student behavioral needs and providing professional development for all staff. Within our 24 uh, improvement plan under goal two, we've identified the social emotional well-being of all students as a shared responsibility uh, across all content areas. Uh, prior to the addition of our new resource, a second behavioral specialist position, we were only able to provide IEP directed services to students with uh, behavioral needs uh, until this year. With the addition of that second professional, we are now able to provide direct services for students without an IEP, provide consultation and observation services, provide trainings on an individual, small group, full building, and program level basis. Uh, so as a result of those efforts, we currently are servicing 27 students with IEPs, receiving specialized uh, instruction around their behavioral concerns. 15 students uh, without IEPs are receiving direct services. 31 additional students have benefited from consultation or observation services. And in regards to the training component that we've been able to offer, the focus has been on identifying the function of a student's behavior and appropriate strategies and interventions to use, as well as how to track the data and use those results to further inform uh, intervention. So as a result of these efforts with the training, um, so far we've been able to conduct this year two district-wide K-12 special education trainings, two K-2 all staff trainings at each of the three individual schools, two trainings for the special education staff at the Functional Life Skills Room at Eight Corners, one training, uh, additional training for all Blue Point Ed Techs on data collection, the MDPs at each school throughout the district. Um, Wentworth, all staff have received a training, and in addition, Wentworth, Wentworth Guidance and Social Work staff have received, received additional training. Uh, and the last piece that we've been able to offer this year around uh, consultation and case management is we've combined our doctoral level psychologist with our behavioral specialist uh, to consult on a, um, a case review model in our social life skills program at the Wentworth School, Middle School, and High School, high school every other week. Lastly, um, efforts in structural and organizational changes. We've explored options to address our functional life skills students' recreational needs, daily living skills, and mobility needs in a way that potentially could benefit more students and also provides operational efficiencies as identified in our 24 month improvement plan under goal four. Uh, in the past, we've contracted out for SWIN services for students who require these services due to their physical therapy needs that only um, water uh, could benefit their mobility and access. Last year, the service was provided for five students at a cost of over $7,500. Uh, so during the course of PLT work last year, our OCMPT staff uh, explored other opportunities that could be available for all of our functional life skills students, not just those with uh, physical therapy needs. This includes <laughs> research, dissertation of uh, area programs, parent survey, um, staffing needs, transportation needs, and budget analysis. As a result, we are piloting our own uh, recreation swim program here um, and that's occurring weekly at the South Portland School. Seven students are accessing the service at this time for a cost to the district of $2,000. Thank you. Um, I had forgotten, and David Currier so kindly ran upstairs and grabbed these. Uh, you know, when people say goal one, uh, I, I suspect that many of you have committed the goals uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, to mind, but I don't know that you know, re remember all of the 14 improvement targets. So in the event uh, that you need to make a reference, they're, they're here. And when I introduce the dashboard, you're going to need this thing to um, understand kind of what you're looking at. Thank you, Allison. <coughs> We'll move on to K2. Are you reporting in? We are. Oh, well, you're I don't know if I'll both? do it all. Like, I like to pause the mic so once she they does. get started, Kelly doesn't have much of a chance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first area we would like to highlight is uh, our commitment to improving our ELA curriculum. So we have, um, as you know, implemented the uh, units of study for writing and work their way 
fully at the K-2 level. Um, these two programs, the Unit of Study for Writing is Lucy Calkins out of uh, Columbia University's Teachers College, and it is um, a very, uh, very successful program. Our kids love it, the teachers love it. Kids are writing more and more every day, and it's just um, phenomenal to see the, the difference that one little change in a program can make. Um, the Words Their Way program is a spelling, vocabulary, and word study foundational program, and that again is being um, fully implemented at all three grade levels, and uh, they've, it's just really helped kids with their, their knowledge of building words and encoding words and decoding words. Um, our, none of this would be as successful as it is without our phenomenal instructional coach, Anne Marie Henderson. She is hands down by far one of the most dynamic, uh, influential, just amazing teachers. And she has inspired all of the K-2 teachers to embrace the new curriculums and love them. And she's done so much to promote and support and, and provide um, help to our teachers to make these programs as successful as they are. We've had a small group of pioneers this year who have piloted the Units of Study Reading Program. So again, with Anne Marie's help, they have um, taken on the new reading program and tried it out to see what works, what works, how well it, it goes along with the writing program. And teachers are loving it and saying that it's not nearly going to be as much work as the new writing program because it does tilt so nicely together and everything sort of seamlessly fits, and I would hope that's the case since the same person wrote both of them, and so she made it work together. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're looking forward to, to uh, fully implementing that next year at all, uh, at all, the, at all the levels. Uh, a second area we wanted to highlight is our move toward um, more student-centered learning, particularly um, student-centered conferences. And we've done that uh, with the help of our instructional coaches and lead teachers, sort of our K-2 leadership team has really helped to develop a focus for our teachers around what is student-centered learning, what do we already do well, what are some things we can improve on, and one of those targets was um, parent-teacher conferences. So we have students attending conferences for the first time ever. Some people have never had a student come to their conference, which is a little bit of an adjustment for some parents, teachers, and kids, um, but we've been moving through that, getting some feedback, letting teachers try out different strategies to see what works, what works at different grade levels, and, and it's been really successful. Um, we just did our second round of conferences. It was much smoother than the, the ones in the fall. People were feeling much more comfortable, um, and kids were going and talking about their work, and leading parts of the conference and even as young as kindergarten. So really positive and exciting stuff. And our third area is our uh, professional growth and um, our PEPG model. Um, so all teachers, all, all staff at Tech Ten teachers have completed a self-assessment and written a growth plan with targeted um, areas of, of growth, one of which is um, communicating rigorous learning goals and tracking student progress. So our teachers have always had high expectations and rigorous goals for their students, but they've usually been in their heads and on paper and they're not necessarily explicitly communicated and taught to the students as this is what we're learning and why in, in language that five, six, and seven-year-olds can understand. So what we're um, doing through um, Marzano's work is really um, honing in on those learning goals and why we're doing what we're doing and why kids need to learn these things and taking them through the progression of through, with I can statements of, you know, I can identify numbers and letters in kindergarten. I know the difference between a letter and a number, something as simple as that, um, to, you know, I can punctuate my sentences correctly with dialogue in them for second graders. So um, the language is, is simple and child friendly, but it lets kids take ownership and responsibility for their own learning. It lets them know where they are in their learning and where they need to go and the steps to get there. And this gets communicated in the conferences with, with students being able to say to their parents, I'm learning this because I need to be a better writer or I'm learning this to 
be able to be a better mathematician and I need to know how to do these things in order to do harder math or they, they have that, those, that language and those, um, that concept of why they're doing something and I think it's been very impressive for parents to hear their five, six and seven year olds communicating their learning in that way. Um, so we're really excited about um, the work that the I Observation and Marzano schools have given us for that. Uh, questions, and I, I didn't invite questions uh, for Allison, but I, I'm sure that someone would have given me the eye if they had a question. All set? Kelly. Sure. So for Wentworth, we are really excited that we've fully realized the investment in a highly qualified um, science and technology teacher this year. The addition of this position, and her name is Dara Thurn, and she's been just fantastic. Um, has provided all students the opportunity to participate weekly in a hands-on project-based STEM course focused on science, technology, engineering, and math for a, at least a portion of the year per grade with one person. Um, we committed in the Student Center Plan to provide resources, optimize time, facilitate multiple pathways um, to ensure that students are able to engage in cooperative, inquiry-based, authentic, and relevant activities to advance their learning. And this position and the work that she's done ties into that goal just perfectly. It was an important piece of work to get done in order to really fully leverage the technology resources that the new Wentworth afforded us and to expose our learners to more complex um, science and engineering concepts beyond those in the existing curriculum um, that they already experienced. In order to achieve the target, we established um, a comprehensive staffing proposal budgeted for the position, hired a really great candidate who's been a wonderful addition to our staff. Um, we initiated <coughs> collaboration among the building leaders, the curriculum director, the instructional coaches, because this is a brand new position for the phase level. Um, a scope and sequence had to be created with regard to how long are students going to be in the course with just one instructor, what are the main topics that we're going to cover in this first year, let's look at what our three year plan is. Um, so all of that work has been done and it's been, um, it's really facilitated and integrated um, f uh, fashion for the kids. Um, as a result of these resources, we were able to increase the student opportunities, like I mentioned, to creatively and collaboratively engage in these critical thinking opportunities. Um, the third and fourth graders received two trimesters of the course, so they had 26 sessions and the fifth graders received one trimester, so 13 st sessions of STEM instruction in addition to their core, core science courses. Um, and we have additional metrics, staff and student feedback, parent feedback, all overwhelmingly positive. Um, the second thing that I wanted to speak about, Casey really did a great job <laughs> summarizing for me, so um, I wanted to talk about our curriculum investment as well, and um, it, it's been the same investment, K-5, um, our school fully also successfully and fully implemented the two new curricula in English language arts with the Columbia Teachers College units for writing and as well as words their way. I would echo everything that they say. We also have um, an instructional coach who's been really fantastic and leading the way. It's been a lot of change and new at Wentworth over the past just 18 months and so the addition of a new curriculum, we really needed that strong anchor to help guide it through and it's going to be okay and it's been a big transition um, but to echo what these ladies have said the um, already the results that we see in the learning and stamina and engagement and excitement of students and their writing has been um, really unbelievable so it's been exciting and I, I, I won't go on and on because again they they've said a lot of it and it will save me a little time in my presentation so a win-win. <laughs> um, with all the new curriculum and as I mentioned all of the things that um, staff have had to learn at Wentworth over the year, um, time has become even more of a commodity for teachers. So a highlight that I'm really excited about relates to the area of structural and organizational changes for Wentworth and this also has been a win-win for students and staff. We've maximized our existing staff resources by developing and implementing a new allied arts enrichment program for all students. So this expansion has provided students with interesting connections and diverse experiences in addition to their typical weekly allied arts courses. 
Um, the enrichment program at the same time was creatively scheduled to simultaneously afford grade level teachers additional learning time to enhance and support their teaching of the new reading, new writing, and to further advance their work in mathematics and word study, of course. So we committed in the student center plan to advocate for um, and nurture a positive climate, child-centered learning. We heard loud and clear at the last community dialogue from students, we want more allied arts, we want more opportunities in allied arts, and so we really made a commitment to that, and we heard really loud and clear from our teachers, we need more time, we need more time <laughs> to, um, to improve our practice and make organizational decisions with students' um, best interests at heart, and this has really met both of those goals. In order to achieve that target, we established the master schedule had to be modified to include a monthly opportunity for allied arts. So in this first year, um, we committed to it for all students once per month, this um, one hour block of an additional allied arts opportunity. And the allied arts team did a fantastic job um, really thinking outside the box. It was wellness themed and creating these incredibly engaging lessons for students that were very different from what they would typically experience in their courses. Um, so while the student, um, oh also I should mention that students in fourth grade have the additional choice this year of um, learning to play the ukulele during this enrichment time which was funded through an SEF grant. So very exciting. Um, while the students were engaged in enrichment, the grade level staff, so the core teaching staff, were able to meet and engage in professional development time. Um, our math and literacy instructional coaches provided the leadership, the resources, the structure, and um, a lot of really great work has been done. So as a result of this shift, the students were provided eight additional big chunks of allied arts enrichment time, and the staff have gained over 10 hours of job embedded collaborative professional development time. So we've um, been really excited about that. Can you talk from a pedagogical perspective to what degree um, with these new initiatives like the Columbia and the mm -hmm. Words Their Way, to what degree is, is tracked learning in terms of like accelerated learning or, and I don't, I, uh, well, um, I don't want to use the word remedial, but you know, the ideas of sort of levels of learning and student achievement, to what degree is that relevant in these new programs and how do, how, how do you address the kids at either end who aren't in the middle? It, I feel, and, and you guys can jump in too, I feel like it's so customized and student-centered that, um, so just to talk about a, a writing lesson, for example, the lesson begins with a launch, and so they talk really, have a little mini lesson about a specific part of writing. So um, today we're gonna learn about writing an exciting lead, and the students have a lesson in that, and then during the workshop time, they go back and work on their own piece that they've created, that's their topic, that they have a lot of ownership in and are excited to get back to and look back, okay, did I start it? Is it exciting? Maybe they'll peer conference, maybe use a checklist. The teachers are checking in with the teachers at the same time and they're constantly revising their drafts. So I think that one of the biggest um, changes that I've seen and improvements is that these, you know, I think for a long time, revision to students was, ugh, but I'm already done. Like, I've already, why do I need to revise this? I'll slap in a couple commas, fix a spelling error or two, call it good. Um, we're seeing something that we've coined a phrase called Franken-draft, that they are chopping it up and taping it back together and really going through a revision process because they're having such targeted instruction on the specific parts of writing. Does that answer your question? And uh, things like words their way, they mm -hmm. break out into, and are those skill level breakouts? Words their way is, yeah. is very skill level. Yeah, they have an, an assessment that, mm -hmm. that helps, the helps guide the teacher to where, where their uh, needs are, so what targeted instruction they're going to receive. So if, you know, if the whole class took the assessment, you might have the four of us in one group and four other people in another group, and they have different word sorts and different activities. They're all similar but they're, they may be at different levels and at different skills, and then the kids work through their skills as they accomplish them and as they master them and are ready. So it all <laughs> again, it starts with, you know, three letters, CBC words, and, and then, you know, their pictures with no words on them, and then by the time they're in second grade, maybe they're, you know, um, irregular noun plural. So, you know, it, it, it builds, and, and every student gets what they need. 
and kids are it's very flexible yeah. with when I get done with mine I can work on the next one and I don't have to wait for her to get done because she's slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we don't think you're slow. No, <laughs> slow at all. We know She's just more thoughtful. <laughs> All set? Other questions? Uh, we're moving on to middle school. Middle school. So um, How quickly the, the years go by. This doesn't seem quite as exciting as the younger grades. So my first <laughs> highlight relates to the area of curriculum resources at the middle school, and we're in the process of implementing two new inquiry-based curriculums for um, all three grade levels. Science, which we call iQuest, social studies, document-based question project, we call it DPQ project. So in our uh, student-centered plan, we made a commitment to implement the two new inquiry-based curriculums in order to ensure clear and common curriculum standards for all students and provide curriculum resources that provide for collaborative learning, inquiry-based, put students at the center of their learning and engage students in authentic, relevant learning activities, which is what I'm hearing <coughs> right from K2. Um, the action steps that we took, well, with the curriculum coordinator's help and your budgetary support, the iQuest curriculum materials and DBQ materials were purchased for this year. We provided um, iQuest training for our teachers during the school day, and that is ongoing. We uh, sent social studies teachers out to DBQ training sessions, and that is uh, off-site, that is ongoing. And due to our new schedule, which we developed two years ago, teachers have time during the school day to meet both vertical teams or horizontal teams to continue to learn together and develop common assessments. And they have developed at least one common assessment uh, for each quarter for social studies and science, each grade level. Um, as far as metrics go, it's unbelievable how excited the students are about their science, hands-on, and DBQ. I, I, going into a social studies class is absolutely exciting. The writing, I cannot wait till these kids mm -hmm. come up. The writing that we're seeing is amazing. And I just, in a couple of years, it'll be even more amazing. So we're doing some really great work. I'm very excited about what's happening. The students are excited about what they're doing, and so are the teachers. Um, so I'm very pleased with what's happening in social studies and science right now. Um, the second item I'd like to highlight is an organizational change. We uh, involved all teachers in a book study. Um, it is uh, Ken O'Connor's Repair Kit for Grading 15 Fixes for Broken Grades. I think I've mentioned it before. Um, it's our, in our student-centered plan, we made the commitment to build common reporting practices to advance student learning. And this book study was used to build a common understanding of those uh, uh, student-centered grading practices, lay the groundwork for a common understanding of standard-based grading, and lay the groundwork for a common understanding of how and why to report to parents about habits of work and pulling habits of work out of the grade, grading stream. So in order to uh, achieve the target, um, teachers learned together, again, read together, learned together, and they were able to do this during the school day in inquiry team meetings. We also met large group faculty meetings. Our meetings became rather heated at times because we're breaking down um, grading practices that we all grew up with and that are changing very, very quickly. Um, some of our teachers are already reporting to, um, to parents um, about how their students are doing um, with meeting the standards in that classroom. Those parents, those students, understand it much better than by reporting out using a percentage grade. Um, I have teachers ready to jump on board and they want to start reporting out to parents right away. Actually, we met with Monique this week and have a plan moving forward for next year. Um, we are already starting to uh, have teachers track habits of work um, and pulling that out of the grade stream. So that is starting and you will see that in effect next year. So this is something I've been excited about. Um, it's time that 
but I have teachers that are ready to jump on board. I have had teachers for two years that have been bugging me to get this going, and they are, I think we're getting ready to launch it next year, at least for many uh, teachers. And the last thing I'd like to um, share with you is another organizational change. This is a, a big one, though. We really looked at how we service all students um, in our school. Um, we made a commitment to provide resources, optimize time, and facilitate multiple pathways to ensure that all students are able to advance their learning. So we did this by developing a school-wide data plan to help create a data-focused culture. Um, we spent um, a lot of our resources on the STAR assessment. We have teachers using it, students referring to it um, to help make a plan for them, their own learning. Um, it's really changed how we're thinking about uh, every student um, learning and, and growing. We redesigned the RTI response to intervention system with a focus on meeting the needs of all students. We redesigned the academic center and worked with Allison's folks. Um, academic center is now a tier two intervention um, and students all have measurable goals and they're also using the STAR assessments to help set those. Uh, we, we redesigned the MDT multidisciplinary team and targeted intervention data collection process. We refined the school-wide intervention period, RISE, Remediate, Improve, Stretch, and Excel. And we are now um, piloting um, students using their STAR assessment, their own data from the classroom to choose the interventions or the uh, stretch activities that they want to work on and that will continue to grow uh, next year. So as a result of these changes, the teachers and students and students are more focused on using data to make decisions about their own learning and about setting goals. The academic center is more focused on teaching students executive functioning skills, like Allison's folks, setting goals and measuring those goals. Students are learning to set their own goals, own goals and make decisions about what they need during RISE. Academic interventions are more focused on data to measure growth, and M our MDT meetings are much more focused, so the team is able to get more accomplished each week. All the changes are in process, but we will continue to refine them for, uh, for next year. And also, we are in need of another teacher to, um, I'm calling the bridge teacher for next year, to help with those students that don't fit into the academic center, that need more than RISE can provide um, and that are not special ed students. So I will be looking for that for next year. Next the middle school. Questions for Barbara? <coughs> um, I see Mr. Kazza behind me writing madly. I, it could be he's writing his diary or he's trying to capture all of this. Um, if you're trying to capture all of this, actually it's all going to be compiled and shared with you in a, in a report. But rather than giving your, your eyes a rest tonight, <laughs> I, just, I was just um, wanting to hes hesitate long enough to get that response. Um, he the papers. Yeah, it was, he's writing madly. I'm like, wow. Um, so, so just so that you know, uh, th this, is, this is all can be presented in a format where you can um, actually hear or review any of the highlights that you're hearing uh, tonight, so you don't have to worry. Um, we'll move on to the high school, David. I'd like to preface my comments with the fact that my colleagues made it very clear to me that I've already used up all of my time <laughs> and theirs. So, yeah. uh, so I'd like to begin with um, the first highlight would be our one-to-one -one laptop program. So uh, with the, the commitment that was made by the school department, school board, uh, the wonderful job that Jen and the technology department did and uh, the support from the community, we've implemented successfully, I think, in the first year, a one-to-one -one laptop program. With that, we also have the added resource of a technology integration coach, which um, uh, Jen has been instrumental in ensuring that uh, we could take teachers from where they are and help them evolve and grow in terms of how they implement technology. Uh, in order to successfully implement the laptop program, it was really important that we had professional development time. So our professional development time has really been split between two resources. The first is one of our late starts, it's designated for the high school's content area work. Uh, some of the times, as I mentioned before, you'll have 
a couple of departments will go into the all-purpose room and Jen Adams will come in with Alicia and others and they'll share uh, uh, methods and strategies to implement or integrate technology into the classroom. They've also used time after school during their department meetings to accomplish the same piece. So as a result, uh, the effects are widespread. If you saw Jen's uh, presentation, which I got edited and cut out, but anyway, um, all the students and staff now have the technology resources necessary for them to really be well prepared for college and career. Uh, staff are able to enrich curriculum. Um, I'm blown away by the progress that's happened. I was hoping that we would have, in this first year, just people embracing the use of technology, but they have just grown leaps and bounds and are, are very excited for the possibility. So the benefits are fabulous. If you go around the school, you see students with their laptops open all of the time, students helping students, staff members helping staff members. It's exactly the culture and climate we had hoped for. Um, secondly, uh, our curriculum standards work. So um, one of our goals has been from the very beginning to align our curriculum and our content areas with national and state standards. So another benefit to the Late Start Wednesday time that we provided, that one extra Late Start time, is our staff has told us for years we're ready to do this work. We know the work that needs to be accomplished. We want to start working on the standards, working on content area. We just need the time. With this extra Late Start that we've had, They've used that time to coordinate those efforts, so they're working collaboratively during that time. Uh, in addition, they're also using their department time. Uh, Monique has done a fantastic job of taking our uh, grade 6 through 12 uh, instructional coaches that are for the sciences mm -hmm. and the humanities, and their targeted work is with the phase levels to ensure there's vertical alignment with the work that's being done. That's been instrumental in helping the content areas not just align what's happening at the high school, but what's happening K-12. Um, and the third piece that I could refer to is, I don't have to say much to it, is because I've talked to a, a great length about it already, is, uh, which reminded me several times, which is school development. Now that, that is something that it, it's really a stakeholder-led stakeholder initiative. Um, when we started talking about student-centered learning approach, we started examining our current practices and it became very clear that organizationally we have not put our students in the best position to be successful to support the programs and services that are necessary. So it was instrumental in helping us change the culture and climate into how we look at how we deliver services to students. So the schedule is an example of that piece. It's been collaborative. I've mentioned that the great work that Emma and Lizzie have done with the students. Um, we have committees that represent each content area that bring to the table at those committee meetings all of the opinions and all of the feedback from each content area to see how a new schedule would impact those different disciplines. Um, and I would say probably the greatest challenge we have moving forward and the biggest piece for us in terms of it being successful is that additional resources that I've mentioned. Um, the 8.6 FTEs are absolutely necessary. It's a necessity for this new schedule to be implemented in two years and to be successful. Without those resources, um, we're not able to put into place what needs to be done. So the continued support like we got for the laptop program from the community to move our students in school to where they should be, that's the same type of support we're asking for with our uh, new schedule. Questions for David? Jen. Oh, um, Michael. Uh, thanks. We, um, I'm excited to share that for the first time since I've been in Scarborough, we, um, we, made, we were able to make a partial investment in one of um, our requested items, and that was a part-time assistant athletic trainer. Um, and we feel that that helped promote safety and enhance the well-being of our students. Um, we wanted to be able to, and needed to be able to, frankly, increase the availability to um, our athletic trainers to evaluate, treat, and rehab um, student injuries. We wanted to be able to cover all our events um, or multiple events on any given day to ensure that safety. We wanted to be more, have a person that was more readily available um, to evaluate um, injuries in a timely manner and deal with emergencies. Um, and 
um, for the first time this year, we were able to free up some time for our head athletic trainer to establish some of those relationships with outside health care providers that could have a benefit to our student athletes as well. So that's been, um, that's been ex exciting too. We hope to, to be able to continue that investment because we want to, um, we want to collaborate um, with coaches to develop some preventative rehab plans for in and out of season. They'd like to run some additional programs for students out of our clinic in terms of strength and balance programs, flexibility programs, increase time, do some coverage at our middle school program because we, um, we some of our, some of the research that's out there in terms of concussion management, um, we should be doing more related to that at the middle level that we're not able to do and even not able to do currently. Um, so we hope to I increase some more investments there. For organizational and structurally, that was kind of a staff resource. Um, we're very excited to share um, some of our, our, our changes in our department in terms of improved efficiencies with the use of technology, our new family online, family ID online registration program and what that's allowed us to do. We have a new web-based coaches evaluation system, which has allowed us to um, communicate better and be more timely about uh, feedback with coaches and how they're doing. We have a new web-based scheduling program called Pinwheel. Um, some of you have gone to our site, been able to see, see those things. And um, we want to certainly continue our cycle investment in safety uh, related items in terms of equipment, refresh and renew things. Um, and as I always do, I, I continue to try to advocate for a reduction um, in, the, in the amount that our parent support groups fund essential components of our programs. And uh, so I, I think you'll see some things coming forward with some plans to want to try to, try to incrementally do that. I know this is supposed to be a fireside chat, and um, I was afraid that by the time it got all the way down to me that maybe people would be tired of chatting. <laughs> so I, I made some handouts um, just to kind of keep people, you know, of course you can have one so you don't have to keep writing everything down. Um, I, think, I think that we pretty much hit all of those um, different target areas. We definitely support um, curriculum and staffing resources. I think we make people and departments more efficient. Um, and we did quite a few structural and organizational changes that I think you'll see here, cost efficiency. So because I work in a world of zeros and ones, I kind of <laughs> like to assign specific numbers to things. So I tried to dig up some numbers and kind of show have some of the things that we have asked you for and you have graciously granted us funds for um, have definitely shown a return on investment over the past couple of years. So if you remember um, back maybe three years ago, we just started telling you about an application called Papercut. And you've heard me talk about it a couple of times in here, but Papercut is a centralized print solution. What it does is instead of the user sending a print job to a specific locally connected printer, so a desktop printer, which everybody used to have, um, it sends it to a server and it sits on the server and now anybody can pull a print job that they send to the server from anywhere in the district. So if you are a K2 teacher and you are up at central office for a meeting, you can print something out and actually pull it from up here. It just requires your code and you can pull it out. One of the things that we've found, and you'll see saved page numbers down here, is that Papercut um, has really helped us to realize some saving by not printing things. So essentially people send things to the printer and they forget about them, or oops, it was a mistake, or they're just what we call abandoned or orphan jobs. So you'll see here that there were roughly, there, this year alone there's been about 50,000 or 60,000 sheets that have been sent to the printer and never printed. Um, so that, that definitely has helped us to save some money. So just a kind of overview, so I don't want to
drag this out too much. Our initial investment was about $50,000. That included licensing, included licensing for existing printers. It did not include, in this number, I didn't include the printers that we purchased because those were printers that we would have purchased anyway. Um, and they're roughly, the, the student printers that we use are high speed, high capacity, roughly $400. So it's not like we invested a, a ton of money in those printers. Um, we also invested money in keypads. If you go to any of the schools that have the smaller printers, there's little keypads, and that's what you type your code into. So the initial investment is about 50000 We have ongoing maintenance just in licensing costs of roughly 3500 In the first year alone, if you look at what it would have cost us to print the number of pages in the 2014-2015 year that we printed, which we can pull all of those numbers through our console. So the district, district-wide over the 2014-2015 school year, printed approximately 2 million pieces of paper. That on inkjet printers would have cost us about $125,000. That's a per page cost of six cents. Through paperclip, by forcing it to the MSPs, the multifunctional printers, forcing it to the large um, high capacity, high, high speed printers, um, we reduce that cost to one cent, so it turns out to be $19,000. So we realize the savings of about 80% year over year. You can see it more than paid for itself in year one. We realize savings in year one, and as we continue to roll forward, we are seeing an average savings of about 80% per year. Okay, so, not to bore you, that was like the exciting part <laughs> to tell you. Then we move on to virtualization, which you know the, this gets the network guys really excited, um, but most people not so much. So virtualization, just <coughs> in a nutshell, we took about 18 servers that we had, servers that did different things toward different data, and we collapsed them into three servers. So essentially it saved us money in maintaining the hardware, replacing the hardware, um, heat loads, power poles, you know, the physical space to actually store them. To replace any one of those servers, it's roughly seven grand just in hardware costs alone. So, you know, having to, being able to actually eliminate that cost is huge for us moving forward. It's not necessarily something that we could track because you kind of never know when a server's going to fail. But the other part that it, it um, the other thing that really helped us with was providing um, much greater disaster recovery and redundancy. So we have these three virtualized servers now that hold everything that the 18 servers did. And at any given time, we only need two of the servers to run all of our critical programs in the district. So we do have automatic failover. We have um, data replication. We have, you know, we have all of that in place now. So I, I sleep easier at night <laughs> when that, that's, that's up and running. Um, there are some rough numbers. A lot of what we actually would see, realize in cost savings are kind of intangible things like the power poles and the heat loads and things like that. So, for example, we have a very small server room and we don't need to boost the air conditioning up as much because we don't have 18 big servers that are pumping heat out the back. We just have three high efficiency servers. Um, and then the third one I wanted to um, highlight here kind of hits everything, I think, but this was really our move to Google. Um, and everybody in the district was involved in this. This was not just an IT, um, IT driven thing. Um, but really the, the main goal was to move all of our existing data resources off of our internal drives. We just were finding that we were maxing out servers, we were maxing out space, we were running out of space. Um, things were going down all the time and it was really difficult from sort of an efficiency and collaboration perspective for our end users to do any work at home because half the time you couldn't dial in and get what you needed. So we started about a year and a half ago to move everything to Google. We have to do it as Google Drive because it's free. The Google Apps for Education is free for schools. Um, so what we saved on the back end was we didn't have to purchase spam filtering licenses, which you can see there is about $7,500 annually. That's provided through the Google Apps. Um, we eliminated the need for exchange license upgrades, which we're going to have to do soon, so that was another $5,700. We eliminated the need to purchase an additional exchange server because everybody went to Gmail. 
so it was another 7,000. And then I, I think more, more importantly, we provided our users the ability to collaborate online, to access their data, access their emails anytime, anywhere. All they need is a machine and, you know, basically an internet portal. Questions for Jen? Uh, we're close to nine, but we are also at the last um, report out. Uh, this is at district wide. It, this will be uh, Monique, and then I'm going to put something up uh, while uh, Joanne reports out, uh, which is the dashboard, so that you can take a, a peek at that. And then I have a big surprise for you at the end. Many of you heard from um, the phase levels on uh, a number of things I could have spoken to. I'm just going to highlight one as it relates to the staffing piece, not really the curriculum piece, um, but absolutely related. Um, we've expanded, as David talked to you about, um, the instructional coaches with the addition of the technology integrator at the high school um, this past year. And the position was crucial in supporting the teaching and learning at the high school. Um, but all the coaches work together as a team, uh, and they support each other across literacy, math, and technology. And they work together very well, and they have to work together because, for example, at K-5, the teachers teach all content areas. And so there are only so many afternoons available a week to work with teachers in the areas of curriculum, so we have to kind of share that time across content areas. Uh, and so they support teachers in that way, but they are the teachers of teachers. So they're in classrooms, they're providing after school training, during school training, summer training. They're also supports during the PLT time. So when a PLT group comes together, they will contact an a, um, instructional post saying we need some help with this piece as well. Um, so they are working um, to put together training, um, but they also stay current on effective practices. It's very hard to keep up across eight content areas across 12, 13 grade levels, in both in terms of pedagogy and content, but these folks stay current in their content area. They work together well in doing so, and they bring in the new ideas. You heard David talk about some of the things that Jen is doing, and Marie has brought some pieces in, in terms of literacy. The math coaches all work together to consider new practices and decide whether we want to go in that direction or not go in that direction. The technology coaches were instrumental in working together to build that STEM curriculum, so when the new staff person came on board, they had support. They knew where, um, what content she should deliver so she wasn't stepping on the toes of the person at the middle school. We also brought them together. They also helped coordinate the curriculum and do that vertical articulation that David spoke of. Uh, so we're working on clarifying those standards so we're ready to go. So for example, at the middle school, they worked very hard to identify and clarify those standards so that the students knew what goals and learning goals they were to be working on. Um, <coughs> so as a result of these positions, we've certainly seen the alignment to the uh, national standards, increased training for all staff, but the expertise has allowed us to improve in the areas of literacy, math, technology, but also it's been a huge cost savings because if I were to hire an outside consultant to help do this work at $1,200 to $2,500 a day, um, it's a great savings to have these people on staff um, and salaried and providing it uh, all day, every day, across all the grade levels. Uh, in addition, the STEM theme programming, we have them kind of out there scouting and things like that. We're going to be contract looking to contract with MMSA to coordinate our offerings, and so they're going to be instrumental in helping that out as well. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Joanne. Okay. So one of the best practices is when you're working with a group of people and the meeting has gone for about an hour, you're supposed to have them all get up and do a few jumping jacks. So I'll save you and spare you that extra. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. But at the end, please, you know, get up and move a little bit. But a best practice would be to have you get up and move. I do notice that my 1E is not up there. No, it's not. I okay. Mm -hmm. But I will uh, start with, um, as you know, a committee has worked for the last three years to bring our district initiative of performance evaluation of professional growth system, which is in our uh, first piloted year. So some of the things that we were looking to do was to continue to build and ensure cohesiveness in the professional learning system. 
In order to achieve this target, we needed to build the understanding of the Marzano model with the professional learning teams model. The focus provided common language and understanding of teacher growth, feedback, and instructional practice. Our staff is in the process of working towards understanding a system that provides common language with a collaborative approach and a focus on teaching and learning. So what steps did we do to, do to get this up and running? The pilot plan for the Marzano Eye Observation was implemented this year. All of the staff have developed a growth plan through the Eye Observation system that identifies one professional growth goal. As a district, we identified a goal to support our learning. This goal was to <coughs> communicate learning goals and feedback for students in the classroom. The PLT inquiries are based on the individual growth plan. The PLT model supports staff learning with their identified goals and supports a collaborative approach. What is the metric that we use to see if it's working? Well, our school leaders are working with eye observations for formal and walkthrough evaluations. The teacher receives immediate, targeted, deliberate feedback related to the Marzano learning map for instructional practice. One of the things that has happened is that all staff uh, will have an observation. It's also cut down the amount of time that was required before. A lot of times when you would go in to do an observation, it would might be a week later before you would get the feedback to the teacher, or sometimes even two weeks, depending on schedule. This has provided staff with immediate feedback, and that's the positive that has come out of this, is staff feel really, you know, I've got the feedback, I understand, we've had a discussion, and we can also collaborate <coughs> online. You can send feedback to the teacher, you can say, please send me a reflection on how you think the class went, and we can follow up like that. So it has really, um, I think, quality assurance and accountability is one of the benefits that has happened with this system. Questions? For uh, those of you who are trying to look at this dashboard uh, on that monitor, I'd give you a moment to just shift around and really take a look at the, the big image here. Um, this, as you can see, um, is the, this is the layout of the, of the um, dashboards that we've created. Um, you see at the top the long-term goal, uh, goal number four is uh, presented up there. The rating key is actually consistent with the kind of rating uh, that is happening in terms of um, uh, teacher performance and even student performance. Um, you'll take a look, uh, the thing that I want to uh, highlight is the structural and organizational changes at the district level and specifically the target that falls under goal four. You see 4A there, which speaks to building and supporting a student-centered culture and climate where there's a shared responsibility of, by all stakeholders. Uh, you've heard uh, those words, student-centered, a lot, and I'm, I was really pleased to hear them because I think that the um, leaders here have provided some really excellent examples of what student-centered really looks like in practice. So uh, we figured that in order to enroll more stakeholders in helping to promote and build a, a learning culture that is above all student-centered, it was really necessary to help our stakeholders understand just what a student-centered learning environment looks and feels like. So at the district level, our central office team set as an objective, and you see the objective in the central part there, uh, basically to create communication vehicles that encourage the community to better understand the link between the budget and school programs, and to do, do that through uh, using a student-centered lens. The success metric um, is there um, for some of the things that you've heard uh, are reported out on tonight. There are multiple metrics. This had just one because this is just really one component of one uh, area of responsibility, namely central office, um, and under um, one of the improvement targets. So, so you're just, you're really sort of focusing in and, and coming uh, to, to uh, see a very small piece of this plan. But that metric uh, basically says that what we would do is that we would create at least one new vehicle, uh, social media vehicle, to strengthen the link between budget and school programs. And particularly important, of course, was to ensure that um, it, it was a social um, media link that would allow us to really uh, educate around uh, uh, 
I see some of you laughing, and I don't really <laughs> appreciate it. You're kind of distracting me a little bit. We're they, smiling. They kind of... Oh. We're so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> we are very, very proud of you. Okay, don't, don't spoil anything yet. Hold on, not everybody knows. So, um, so it's one new uh, vehicle by uh, social media. And um, so you can see on the dashboard here that there is a big what? A. a which means what? You're applying. No. Fully implemented. Fully, well, applying, but fully implemented. Yes, I wanted to hear the fully implemented part. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just uh, show you, introduce to you, uh, what that social media, um, <laughs> hold on, it takes, it takes me a tiny bit of time here. Don't look at his password. Jen, you didn't close this down. I, yeah, that's the thing you are yeah, about to witness. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I know it's Hendrick. Right I know it's I don't know. What's that mean? Come here. <laughs> Let her show me. You can turn to in, can We're going to do this again. So if it's already up here, Jen, yeah, it's already in this. It's not. So you need to go to Facebook. Okay, maybe if I just show you. Hold on, hold on. Okay, okay, I knew it was. Hi. <laughs> I want to turn it, uh, the lights out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the photography is really pretty special. Oh, oh, wow. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. So this is the um, Superintendent Scarborough, Maine, brand new um, Facebook page, and incidentally, more than 800 hits in the first week. Um, so. Um, now this has been a bit of a joke, and people have been have, have been kind of messing with me a tiny bit about it. But um, you know what the problem is? I'm like the I'm like the kids in first grade that are so used to using their finger on their screen that I cannot do this old-fashioned thing that I've got. Um, it kind of looks like if you look at the shoulder you're, you're up. stretching your right arm. Yeah, like that. What? Your picture is it a selfie? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, so it does have uh, a bunch of uh, different news. I think it was uh, nice for Kelly and I to really be able to share um, a, uh, a message out to parents that things were fine over at the middle school. Um, uh, we're getting some comments here. Uh, I, I think that this is, um, you know, a nice opportunity to really bring to life some of what the, the leaders here are really talking about. This is a, um, our Marzano Users Group. It's just a, a small group of the, the uh, staff of um, school leaders here in Scarborough who are taking a very active role in shaping the whole uh, performance evaluation and uh, professional growth uh, process um, by providing some extraordinary um, uh, input uh, to peers by doing peer reviews but they have to know about inter-rater uh, reliability in order to do that. Um, in terms of, um, there was even a preview of what was happening here tonight and, and uh, around the, the report out. Um, you know, uh, part of what we talked about in terms of student-centered learning is really is voice and choice. And um, these boys, eighth graders, um, became a, um, an ad hoc uh, book group uh, simply by the, the choice that they made in terms of uh, the, um, uh, the book uh, that, they were, that they were studying and reading together and, uh, and so on. And some, and some news about, uh, there's my dog, Sierra, um, personalizing it a little bit. This got a lot of hits, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and really talking about some of the other uh, news that I think is, is kind of important. I know those of you who are experts at Facebook, 
are probably going, ha, 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 he doesn't really know what he's doing. But I kind of think I do, and I got 800 hits this week. So um, that's, that's uh, what I wanted to share with you, and that's a nice way to wrap up. And I'm happy to answer questions about Facebook or... <laughs> Any questions? I know. Oh, I thought, oh, and since I'm on TV, um, anyone in the district can get to this and um, also be a, a part of my Facebook following or the superintendent's <laughs> Facebook following, and I want to see those numbers go up. So I think I'm responsible for, like, I, I invited a, I a lot of people, so, like, 40 of my friends after I invited, so I'm taking I credit for a lot of your likes. Friends? Okay, yeah. Getting refresh, 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 refresh. No, so I invited, no, I invited, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, also okay. my friends. <laughs> Yeah. Should be saying hit. Well, clarification like, on what a hit is? Like well, it's people's page views. Is that what you're talking about? Why 800 page, page views? Yes, of course. Page Why? views, David. Why? I appreciate the superintendent of Scarborough Main page like the the Scarborough. Yeah. That was that was a that was a mistake. That's nice. That's <laughs> no, it's no. Oh, you would appreciate it if I did that? No, you did. No, you did. Oh, I did do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Of course I did. Uh, it's a, you, you probably guessed it's a bit of a collaborative effort between yeah. Kelly Johnston and myself. So then you see it and you're so happy, you like it, and then it says that you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I do like it, actually. Okay, so, fine, um, fine. Yeah. Um, George? George? So yeah. David. Oh, Kelly wants to know if this is going to replace your Prezi's? I think this tops the Prezi's. I think so. I think I'm very proud of you. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Kelly, because I know you're being sincere. Other people are kind of kind of messing with me, but thank you. <laughs> okay, I, um, I think that wraps up our, our workshop. Um, this has been a lot to listen to. You know, I know about all of this work that's happening in the district because I hear about it, I'm engaged in it, we're working together on it, we're reporting to each other, we're checking in with each other. But when I sit and listen to us go through the sequence, through the, you know, start with um, special services, go through sort of the developmental sequence, go to some of the um, other departments. It really is just always so amazing to me the kind of, the volume of work that is ongoing and what has been accomplished by this amazing team um, that makes up the leadership council. It's, it's truly amazing. You will not, and I can say this because I'm leaving, but you will not find this in any other district around. This level of work, this level of commitment, this level of engagement, and what is actually happening and, and making changes for students, you will not see it happening at this pace with this energy that you are seeing right here. So it's really, it's something to embrace. It's hard to get your head around it, and I do, I hear it myself. We use a lot of jargon, and I apologize for that. But I think you kind of, you, you kind of get it, even if you get a few, you know, acronyms thrown in here or there. Um, it's amazing work, and each of these uh, school leaders and the respective leadership staff and their respective faculty are really engaged in awesome stuff here in Scarborough. So, thank you all. And I warned you that that would happen, didn't I? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. You want to stay all night, or are we going to have an adjournment? All right. Need a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? <laughs> okay. Thank you.